recording is going. All right, so this is the talk. Uh, it's called Rip and Tear. It's got nothing to do with Doom. Uh, let's just crack into it. Okay, so every talk has an intro. This one's mine. Um, okay, so every talk I do does disclaimers and warnings and etc. And welcome to that. So the, the big one here is that I wrote most of this talk during the uh, Unity drama. And normally preparing talks is something that I really enjoy. I find it quite easy. I really struggled with this one. It was actually hell to work on. And um, as a result, there is a lot of, like, some parts of this talk are actually a lot more rough than my normal ones. Um, it's a lot more sweary. It's a lot more angry. Um, but I'm hoping that the content is still really useful to people. Even if for a lot of people, we're migrating away from the engine and the current thing we're working on may be the last thing we do in Unity. Um, so, yes, so the, as always, like, who am I? Um, I go by Create Smith on my so most social media platforms. My name's Kira Lord. Um, I worked on these games down here. I used to be a programmer at Five Live Studios. Um, they got downsized quite recently, and unfortunately that means that I'm out of a job right now. I'm going to start chasing that thing off in a couple of weeks. Right now, I am on holiday. Well, actually, reasonably soon. I've been on holiday for the last three weeks. Um, so, what you should expect for this talk. Um, this is exclusively a, a Unity Editor Hacks talk. Um, we're not going to be looking at anything that goes into builds. In theory, some of the practice, the practical stuff for this could go into a build. Um, but the process for doing that is very different. Uh, there's different limitations. I'm not experienced enough in doing those, so that's outside the scope. Um, also, uh, a lot of the solutions talked about in this are what I describe as brittle. The things that I've avoided putting in other talks, and also like the solutions you can't re that you will need to maintain. And I don't suggest providing them as like an asset store plugin or an open source plugin where you're maintaining them for other people because they'll rely heavily on the internal stuff in Unity source code that may change drastically and does change drastically between versions. Um, the second part is uh, this talk is about process. I'm not just going to give you a couple of examples and you're supposed to be very impressed. Um, what I'm really trying to do here is, like, I, I do talks through examples, but um, in this case, I'm really trying to show my process for doing these things in the hope that Either my process will in full or in part work for you, or you'll be able to abstract what I'm doing in my way and find your own process to do the same sorts of things. Um, and as such, I've cut back on the examples I give. They're not actually as full featured. Normally I like to put like very robust uh, industry standard kind of good designed uh, things in and try to go through everything in detail. Um, Doing that in these cases and describing all of the process involved is very difficult. So these are trimmed down to for the benefit of um, illustrating the like only the stuff really to make them work and make them fit for this talk. Um, okay, so finally another thing. Uh, this talk I am going to be rattling off a whole load of personal opinions and pent up vitriol. You know. I'm going to swear a lot uh, once we start getting into this stuff. So just bear in mind that a lot of this stuff is my opinion, not necessarily, well, the coding stuff is probably fact. My opinions are my opinions. I'm not representing them as facts. Uh, this was more a slide back when I was employed and I'm just like, please don't go after my employer. But in this case, it's more like, okay. yeah, don't go after me for things I'm claiming. Okay. so. Other things, uh, look, trans rights, human rights, uh, housing is a right, we shouldn't have investors, just fucking it. Um, there's no such thing as a good billionaire, fossil fuels are killing us, and fuck you, John Riccatello. <sighs> okay, there's a bit of a story behind that one. So the reason I'm doing this talk uh, is back in 2016, I did a talk about how Unity had become more difficult to use uh, it was more confusing, it was getting more less productive to work in, and at the time I was very optimistic that Unity would turn this thing around. I was fucking wrong. <sighs> Fast forward to now, Unity has gotten much harder to use, it's much more confusing. The, the addition of packages at the time seemed like a really good idea, but the way that they've used them and the versioning for them can be best described as like, chaotic or completely lunacy because like if you've ever tried to roll back a version you just find yourself in absolute hell 
Um, the new features problem has gotten a lot worse. Previously, things like it had rolled out Mechanem and it took about a year before it went from being a bit rough to being perfectly viable. Um, look, their current UI system, I have no idea if or when it's actually going to be usable. Uh, Dots, in my opinion, will never be usable. Uh, I know that they're putting a lot of work into it, but there's some foundational errors in that way. And they, they don't make games with these things, so they don't know that you can't make a state machine with dots, for instance, or it's hell to try to. Anyway, that's off the topic of this talk, but if you want to talk to me later another time about the problems with dots and that sort of thing as a generalized thing for game development, feel free. I have many opinions and they we've, I've researched them very deeply. Um, okay, so where, why are we here? Well, the problem was that around 2014, 2015, Unity's core business model chart and started changing its direction, and that has accelerated over the next last couple of years. They're not about making game as games engine anymore. They're more about advertising and other industries, especially like gambling, military, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and they haven't ever built games full games internally. Well, haven't ever finished any. Um, they had that one project where they spun up a studio to run that thing, and it got too difficult or I believe it got too difficult, and they were just like, fuck it, <laughs> just fired that entire team. It's depressing. Um, so yeah, they don't dog food the, the engine, they don't know about the problems until somebody screams about them, which is kind of what this talk is. <sighs> so they went, the other thing is they went from a small team, which is well-controlled, good direction, to a team of like 7,700, that's the last stat I saw doesn't matter how good your team is at that point, if you grow that quickly, everyone's just running in random directions. Add to that the fact that a lot of the core um, original staff left that drove that original direction, and it's painting a pretty bleak picture. And this is just too fucking familiar for me. You see, I was at Pandemic Studios many years ago, and we died in a growth spiral uh, in the process of being merged with Bioware um, and then sold to EA. And the, our CEO through that whole process was John Devs a fucking it, it's Riccatello. Um, and, well, at the time of writing with current CEO of Unity, uh, at this time, not. Um, now, the important thing is he's not solely to blame. Uh, there's been a lot of rumors and stuff that have come out since, and I've had details, like that the Iron Source people are not good actors. Um, get an opinion, but also that um, going back as far as 2014, some members of the board were acting in very, very strange ways um, that were not good for the sort of product I want to work with, and I'm assuming that goes for people uh, for people listening to this talk. Anyway, let's get out of this because this is not really what you wanted to listen here. So what you can expect from this talk, my talks are normally very fast, very technical. Um, if I'm going too fast in this one though, please ask me to slow down. We have time. Previous, normally that's because I have a horrific time limit. Um, and yeah, I'm generally not aiming for you to understand everything that gets covered in this talk because um, there's going to be a lot. I'm just, I generally condense about three years of learning that I've had down into a single talk. So um, just try and get the high levels and you can refer to VODs, slides, uh, the slide and code links are on the screen. I can post them into chat if that's helpful for people. Uh, so you can even run ahead of me on the, the slides if you want. Um, and the other thing is I'm going to be breaking up this talk for live demos. Um, just I've got Unity running and I can demonstrate how some of this stuff operates rather than just having a screenshot, which was all I had time for in the original talk. Um, oh yeah, for anyone who's like, I don't know if anyone's joined during the intro. Oh, a lot of people have not joined during the intro. This is like free question and answer while I'm going through the talk. So please, if anything doesn't make sense or you need more detail about something, please interrupt me with the chat. Um, there was a glitch earlier where people couldn't uh, join into the chat, uh, so I'm hoping that's fixed now. Uh, okay, cool. So the next thing is just easing into what we're doing and talking about why. So this is going to basically going to be a relatively simple example compared to the stuff we do later. Um, so the problem, by and large, always comes from this one place. Uh, Unity is missing a lot of features, despite it being a relatively good development environment. Um, some of them are absolutely amazing. I, like, this is hyperbole. It, 
they shouldn't ship necessarily ship day one, but at fifteen years in, they should have something in the in in a lot of these cases. And this talk is really about not necessarily filling all those gaps, but showing that no matter what, no matter how much they necessarily have tried to make it difficult accidentally or deliberately, they can't stop you adding um, a feature you need into Unity. Um, now, a good example of to start with is just Unity Search. It's um, on the surface level, it covers a key feature. It's that uh, search anywhere, command palette, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's like press a key, hot key, type a couple of like letters, and the thing you're trying to find from the menus or one of your files appears in the top three items. You just use the D-pad to select it, and away you go. In practice, it fails. It's so bad that I think most people don't use it. Uh, and it falls down to that normal problem. It's tested by a tech demo. They don't test their things in actual games, and at even the scale of a relatively small game, it becomes kind of rubbish. Uh, it doesn't work as that core jump to feature that we use in other tools. Now, I'll be explaining this from my perspective. What what breaks this for me? It's that this is basically a single hotkey for the search. And then after that, you have to type a filter for the search, like, well, I only want to search the scene or the menu or the project. Because on any decent sized project, all of those objects, all of those sources, have got enough items in them that any other search that doesn't filter them is pointless. Um, and then it also misses like actual use cases of search, like use cases of searches that we really do need, but they didn't have. So, like, I want to edit a specific component in on a game object or in a prefab or like in my selection. I just want to see like find the the rigid body in this mess, and I want to edit it. So if you use, use uh, if you've used Unity for a decent amount of time, uh, you'll know that features get added and forgotten. And it, it's my opinion that the search is at a forgotten phase of development. So we either need to find a workaround, or we need just to fucking fix it ourselves. And this is the fucking fix it ourselves talk. So here we go. Um, so what are we actually going to fix? Well, the use cases are kind of what I ex just explained. I go ahead of myself. Um, I want to have independent hotkeys set up automatically for my whole team so that we have a hotkey for project search, a hotkey for hierarchy search, and menu search. Um, I also need to modify the search so, or add a functionality so this it, I can search through components on the current game objects just so that I don't need to scroll through the inspector. Um, like. I've dealt with some very, very tall, like player game objects, which have got pages and pages and pages of components, and I'm looking for one specific one. It's absolutely terrible. Um, so fortunately, many of these things already exist. Like all of those menu search, hierarchy search, scene search already exist in Unity. Uh, they just don't have hotkeys by default. And get like I could actually just assign hotkeys to them. They do have shortcut bindings that don't have any keys but I want the whole team to be able to get them by default. So, uh, also, uh, Unity's drastically changed a lot of the API between 2020 and 2021 onwards. Um, and this talk will be compatible with 2020.3 onwards. So we're gonna do a lot of if in the code, like if defs to provide like old and new API changes, things like that. Uh, the way that you do that, by the way, if you haven't done a lot of it, is that the Unity documentation is a fantastic way to know if the um, the version, like if a particular function exists in one version and not another. So what I'll tend to, I'll tend to do is I'll have a version of my project in Unity, uh, so each version, and I'll have the assets folder sim linked between those two projects, so that if I change the the source code in one, it changes it in both. If something breaks, I look up that function in the documentation. I look down this version select thing for the page for that function, and it'll tell me which versions that thing has. Um, basically, if you're below the versions without this page line, that's when it didn't exist. It might be in the private uh, part of the API, like private or internal. Uh, basically, they'll have a, a, a documentation page for every single um, uh, function that is in the public API. So it's a good way to go about it for most things. So this is how we add shortcuts to your code. It's relatively simple, like all fits on one page. Uh, one note, 
this actually has a bug that I've just fixed in the source code, so but I haven't had time to update the slides. Uh, but I'll cover that in just a second. So basically, this is the function we're going to use for rebinding all the things. It's actually really simple, but because of some of the this is like one of Unity's less nice uh, APIs, uh, it looks quite wordy. Um, we're, all we're doing here is basically checking, like grabbing the, the binding for the, that particular string, and then we're going to reuse this function for all the different bindings we're after, and then we're assigning a key combination if none exist. So basically, we get the binding. If the binding doesn't have any keys assigned to it, we log out, we're assigning this binding to this key, and then we just go through, create a binding, and assign it. It's relatively simple. Um, the next step here is, uh, and I'm two things wrong here. One, I'm missing the menu search, which I have added in my own code. And the other thing is, this is something which I put in the initialize on load method. And I've recently discovered there's a bug in here where if you set shortcuts in the initialize on load um, stage of, and the project is just starting up for the first time, it will actually interrupt the process of adding in the main menu shortcuts and you will never get them back until unless you do some nasty things. So uh, warning, don't assign shortcuts in initialize on load, always put them in a delay call. Actually, what I'll do is I'll pop up in the source code for this. So uh, yes, uh, let me see. This is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so let's see what happens to array size, nothing at all. Not helpful. Okay, so this here is that rebind function, uh, and rather than having uh, this is the initialize and load method, I've just put bound the uh, functionality into a new function called do rebind. So I call editor uh, I sign add that to edit application dot delay call. Um, that just pushes it off to after engine engine initialization, but before it actually does anything else. And that'll help you avoid this bug. Um, cool. Uh, yes, cool. So that assigns those shortcuts. So, oh, so yeah, these are the shortcuts I'm binding. Um, and one other thing was uh, these shortcuts changed between the old version. They renamed search to, uh, quick search to search in 2021.1. Uh, and um, they also renamed a couple of other things. So the, the shortcut paths changed. These shortcut paths, by the way, match up to the ones that are present in the shortcut window. If that's if you're curious, what those are, they're not. They don't necessarily match up to like the the uh, main menu paths. Uh, and these things just uh, like I'm just binding the rebinding the existing shortcut for um, like help search assets, which is search the project. Um, or the hierarchy. Okay, so um, going back to that problem that Unity only builds features for the tech demos, the third thing that I really needed from this wasn't just the hotkeys for those, well, second essentially, hotkeys for those buttons, for those particular individual searches, like I only want to search the project, I only want to search the hierarchy of the menu. Um, well, they didn't really add anything to the um, like this unity search doesn't actually solve any problems that we couldn't already solve like the hierarchy window already searches the hierarchy you can already type something into that search box you can already search the project with this project search filter and on OS X there already was a hotkey for for searching through the menu like it's nice to have it on windows but they haven't actually done anything <laughs> um the the big missing one is uh, having a jump to shortcut for components for me uh, when I'm working in Rider, which is my preferred C, uh, C Sharp IDE, I will generally get to the file class I want to, and then I will use, like, it's Alt plus forward slash, I'll jump, like, use that, and then I'll search within the file. That's what I'm after. So here is a shortcut. I, I want this sh um, jump to component. Um, what does this look like? Well, here's a short, hit the screenshot, but I can actually demo it. I actually have time for this stuff. Because, yeah, uh, let me know if it's too small, I can rearrange things, uh, just through this together. Uh, but basically, yeah, let's, um, let's just go into my example. Uh, this project is uh, the thing that's available in the source code, a link on the slides. So there's a little game here, which is a little thing I made ages ago when I was thinking of uh, <laughs> running my own little YouTube education channel thing. So it's just a little... Um, tank 
game like this. I don't go through how to teach that, uh, how to make that, but side effect. Um, so we'll just go into like the player tank prefab here, and I want to find. Ah, let's just go into the search. I don't, don't want the search. I want the. This is my component search, and notice how it's pre-filled with the components from this object, and then I'm taking advantage of the the fact that the search window has an inbuilt um, uh, inspector built into it that you can have. So I can also just press click open or press enter and I will get a dedicated inspector window, technically a property window they're called now. Um, these are exactly the same things you can get uh, by right clicking on a property and, and it's like, and uh, like going, say I right click here and I go properties, pops out one of these. Um, terrible name, but yeah, so really helpful just locked inspector windows for individual components um, but yeah and then I've also got another version where I, I can get search for components in children and they both work for multiple objects so and I've got all the like transforms for these things and I can search for like transform oh because they are on the transform not all things will show up uh, but yeah rigid body find the rigid body um, cool so that's that, that's what we're building. Um, back to the slides. Okay, cool. Now I actually need to get myself back to the slides. I don't have enough monitors for this. Okay, so Unity's not gonna make this for me. Um, Unity generally only makes something once people scream enough for it and somebody demonstrates how they work. For reference, uh, this is why me uh, one of the reasons that mechanism behaviors, like state machine, mechanism state behaviors exist. You're welcome, actually. I built the prototype, they stole it. Oh, the search isn't showing up. Oh, terribly sorry, okay. Let me um, crack open, let me just modify my uh, view for that. Okay, um, yeah, now this is... Okay. <sighs> Righto, so... Um, that working? So this is the um, search window. Cool. Uh, yeah. So won't waste too much time on it. Basically, uh, by default, it shows up all the components on the selected object or objects, and then I can filter that by names. So rigid body. Um, it has an inspector built in, and I also can do. I have a second uh, version of it, which is on a different shortcut, where it will do get components and children on the selection. So it'll show you all of those, and I can filter the components. the the prop the uh, description name underneath is the path and type name of the component. Or it should be. I think there's a bug here where everything is getting the the name transform on it, which I probably need to look into. Uh, yeah, there are dedicated buttons at the top of the inspector for this as well. Um, cool. So, back to slides, back to slides. <sighs> Thanks for the heads up on that, by the way. Um, okay, so, yes. Uh, so we're going to have to build our own one. Um, fortunately, there is a good public, well, good. There is an existing public API for this. I don't think it's very good. Um, that lets us add new search providers. So that's what we're gonna use. On the bad side, it's uh, very unity. Uh, someone who with a software engineering background got in here and added lots of classes and things like that. Um, but to create our component search, we basically need to do a couple of things. First of all is we create a new provider object that does the functionality. Um, it Grab, it needs to grab all the components in our current selection. Um, it needs to filter them by the text search string. And then we need to bind shortcuts and buttons to opening those searches directly. And so we're gonna start building this provider. So this is the top of um, the class for adding a provider. Uh, it's a static class. These provider things are not actually, uh, you don't override a class for them. You basically create one and return it. Or in our case, we're actually gonna create two. The, Get components one is one, and get components in children is the second one. 
Um, they'll share most of their functionality, so you there'll be one. Generally, there'll be one function for everything, and occasionally there'll stumps for one picking which version we're going to use. So this is the start. We basically have a static class that contains all the stuff for this. We also have constant strings for the provider IDs for these um, internally in the system. And when you're accessing providers, they have a name ID essentially as a string. And you um, create functions like static functions that have a search item provider attribute. And those will return an item of type, like an object of search provider, and that is your provider that's been fully decked out with all the stuff to make it do what you want it to do. So because both of these are almost exactly the same, the only difference is one calls get component, one calls get component in children. Um, these just call both call a shared function called build provider um, with true or false. And this is build provider. Um, it's relatively simple. The thing at the top here is just a bit of tuple logic for me to get choose a set of three variables depending on if we're including children or not. So the, the basically, if we're including children, our provider ID is the include children provider ID, the display name for the window is that, and this is the filter text. And that is the sort of um, thing where if I have a, um, if I open the standard search window, this is the text that I need to enter. So in the, in the case of getting component, it's forward slash colon. And in the, the for the get component in children one, it's double forward slash colon. Um, I don't expect they're going to be used much, but um, I added them in anyway. Um, then the rest of this here is just return new search provider. Um, and the constructor argu arguments are just the provider ID and the display name, but the rest of it is actually stuff most of it you have to fill out. The filter ID is um, optional, um, but so we've the settings that we're applying in here are like the filter ID, do we show the display panel? Um, if it's an explicit provider, which means do these search options appear in a, def search, in a default search that doesn't specify what you're searching for? Uh, and we say yes, because we don't want to add stuff to that already messy shit. Um, and then we have a list of different detail stuff here. So I want to show the inspector, I want to show the actions, um, and then everything after here is methods um, that are like delegates to methods. So um, the, the critical ones here are, that you have to use are fetch items, to object, and actions. Although actions is different, so this is, you'll see here that actions here is only defined if 2021 or newer. Um, there's a different way to, in the old API to do that. Um, but adding in the other ones is like fetch thumbnail, start drag, track selection. Those are all really useful quality of life things. So while I haven't covered them in the talk slides, they're in the source code. Um, and I'm happy to go through those if anyone is curious about how some of those things work. Otherwise I may gloss over them. Um, so here's an example, um, the fetch items routine here. Um, so we be did bind this thing as a closure. So essentially in this case, fetch items, we have this thing here where we call it and it, we take, it takes include children. So it's either true or false. Uh, closures are bad in your, source, in your uh, builds, but we can live with them in searches and things like that inside the editor. Um, so this is that function there. And one of the really important things is, is that all those uh, function delegates that we bound, they have the option to act like coroutines. Um, they can return I enumer uh, enumerable, and yielding null will have them pause for one tick, which is really useful because a big search could potentially lock up the editor. So um, what this function is going to do is this is going to grab all the objects for the current um, from the object and then filter them by the search uh, search string. And then um, we are going to not uh, process that entire search in one go or the filtering in one go. We're going to do that over multiple frames um, in a way that would make people scream normally because we're using link, but this is the editor. This is not a performance critical part of the editor even. So this is fine. Um, so this is really simple. Um, the first thing I do is I take the search query from the that we get passed in and I split it on white space. Um, this just this is a simple split filter search that kind of thing that I, that I use all over the place. Um, and 
we check if it's a blank, uh, the, the search text is blank or white space, um, because we want to show all our components um, if it is a blank search. Otherwise, we want to show the ones that actually passed the filter. Um, and then the process is actually this, this query here. And the result of the query is we will uh, basically create um, search items, which is the sort of the the point of this function is that you fill out the um, items array that it passes in with search items. Uh, so what we're going to do is basically either call get components in children or get components on the selection. Um, this get selected game objects thing here is a little workaround. Uh, it change it handles a use case where I want to do want it to behave a little bit differently. If you not nothing selected and you're in the root of a uh, and you have a prefab open, I want it to automatically select the root of the prefab. So it's just a helper function that either grabs the selection or grabs the root of an open prefab stage. Um, if you want me to show you that, I can, but it's not in the not in the talk slides. After that, uh, distinct, probably unnecessary. Also is if checking null, but I'm just, I'm just paranoid about that stuff. Um, after that, we just um, we start just selecting tuples. So we, we call get path, and get path is where I think there's a bug currently. Which um, where it's all the types are currently said to uh, it's adding transform on the end of all of them. Uh, but leaving that aside, we'll look at that in a bit. Um, basically, what we're doing is we're getting the component and we're getting the score of the component using a function called get score, which we'll show you in a sec. Um, the idea is that if it's a blank search, um, everything gets the score of zero. Um, if not, um, we will only select items that have a score greater than zero. That's how I do my scoring function works. Um, and then we create the search item, which just has the item stored as the um, data reference. Like the component goes into the data reference, the score, we give the negative score because the search window uses, uh, puts the lowest one first, but we actually, our scoring works off like better is higher. And everything else here is just like the, um, uh, the type name and etc. So relatively simple. Oh, yeah. The most important thing is we don't then just like flood that to an array. We um, we loop through that link query, um, yielding after every frame, and we just add them one at a time to the uh, uh, to the output array. Um, so get score is also relatively simple. It's a lot simpler than it looks. Basically, the the thing here is that we take in those splits, those words. So we, we already took the search string and we split it into words by using split white space. Um, and we will then go through, loop through each of those splits and we will check if they exist in the string. And I use index of here because string.contains does not have a um, uh, ignore case option. And then what we do to actually calculate the score is that if we have one of these words inside our the name that we're checking against, um, we will add the like it, there will be it will be given points onto the score for how many letters were in that word. So if we just have a one letter word, uh, it'll only be worth one point if that matches the type name of the component. Sorry, if the if it matches the name of the component, the game object, or five points if it matches the type name of the component. Um, these are just the values that I use, and I found that they work reasonably well. Um, so yeah, I'm in here. I'm searching both the um, the name of the component and also the type name of the component. So that what that's why there's two checks in here for each loop through. And then it just returns score. Oh, and if it doesn't match anything, the score is negative one, which means it's invalid for this for the search window. Um, we're also going to reuse that kind of search in a simpler form later, so just be ready for that. Um, then we have the open item action. This is the thing that we added into the actions list in the build provider function. Um, in this case, we are just going to call for, for Unity 2021.1, 21, uh, 21 uh, we will just call open editor, uh, editor utility dot open property editor, and that's a public API function that just opens a new property editor for this particular object. Really nice. Um, this function uh, it used to also exist, but just didn't exist in the public API. So in older versions, we just use reflection. We just 
um, get the type uh, unity editor or property editor uh, by string. We then get the method open property editor from that by string using some binding flags, and then we just reflection invoke that method. Uh, exactly the same function, just calling it by reflection for older versions. We'll be doing this a lot. <laughs> um, so in the old version, as I said before, like the, adding the actions in the build provider function is only uh, in the new API. In the old API, there was a, another st static um, method attribute. So we have a static function that just returns uh, an I enumerable of search actions. And we just return uh, like a collection of them. And they're not for any particular <laughs> search provider. You just create them and specify, oh yes, uh, this is a new search action for like this provider ID. So we just build two. Uh, we build one for opening um, a um, opening, uh, like pressing enter or selecting open on uh, get, uh, get component uh, search provider and one for the get component children search provider. They're exactly the same one. Um, we're just doing exactly what we did in the build function before. Um, one of the neat things about this way was that you could add extra actions to providers you weren't building yourself, but I haven't really found a use case for that. Um, but yes, uh, uh, this one is a little bit of an aside. I really added this into the talk because uh, this is a really damn fucking useful function that I've used uh, on every single project I've had since like oh, 2015, 2014 or something. Um, this is how I get um, icons for the editor that matches up with the way that Unity draws icons for the project and project window and the hierarchy window. Um, and it's really quite simple. The, the process is that some types support uh, custom icons. And so we, for those types, um, like mono behaviors, scriptable objects, we will call um, editor GUI utility to call get icon for object. And then um, if a script doesn't have one, scripts have special icons. I think prefabs have special icons too, but I haven't done that here. Um, so in those cases, we'll actually just um, look them up by their name here using uh, editor GUI utility to icon content and um, by getting the name, like looking them up by name and picking the image as a texture. So um, as a final fallback, um, the default um, the default to, um, icon for anything that doesn't match any of those patterns is just found using uh, edge to GUI utility dot um, ob uh, object content for that object. And like, this is in the source code, uh, basically handy. This is the thing that uh, the fetch um, icons is calling on every single object as that goes through. And yeah, this just returns the same icon that Unity will use everywhere else. So really handy. I don't mind if you steal it, just go nuts. It's something that I should just provide a single function for. Um, okay, so at this point, we have built a search provider. So if I just like, go to here, fire up Unity. And um, if I was just to type press control K and I was to select an object and then go forward slash colon, it would select, it would activate the search but we want a dedicated hotkey, so we don't need to type that in. And we also want to go and add like these buttons up here so that other members on our team can find these things. And when they look at the tool tips, they find out what the shortcut keys are. And hopefully that helps them like remember to use this thing because good UX is kind of like multi-vectors to get into the same sorts of things. So, um, right. So here we are, um, keyboard with shortcuts. So uh, adding shortcuts is relatively simple. Um, again, attributes on static methods. Uh, the shortcut attribute, um, the first thing it takes is its path, the shortcut window. So, uh, so like, remember again, this is not adding menu items, this is just adding shortcuts, um, keyboard shortcuts to the shortcut system. Uh, and then the second, well, the rest of the parameters are the um, different key codes that like make up that default shortcut. So alt backslash, I'm just matching the 
the ones from but that I use in writers, so you could change these to whatever you want. For my get components in children, a uh, get component one, and then alt shift slash for uh, get components in children. And I've got the same thing here because both the quick searches are the function to open these quick searches will be exactly the same. I'm just offloading it to a separate function with true or false if it's the in children version. And then open quick search is that function. And we have two versions here. Here, the top half is for Unity 2021, and this up bit here is for the old API. The old API is actually nicer. Um, in the new API, it's it gets kind of woolly. You create a search context, and then you have to create a search view state from that, and then you like it gives you more options. Like we can specify the width and height of the window. We can specify like other things, we could give the window a custom name, which is very nice. Um, hide different elements of the window, but honestly, uh, I really much prefer the sort of having a, a static function where I call like quick search dot open uh, open with contextual provider and then just arguments. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that, but that's how it works now. So, um, so. Then we just add this the inspector header buttons. We're going to be doing this stuff quite a lot through the rest of the talk. Um, so the first part is just uh, initialize on load method, and we will bind a function to the editor.finish default header GUI uh, callback. This delegate is called whenever the inspector window has just finished drawing its top bar. So the prefab icon the name of the thing, the layers and tags tab, etc. But it draw it's what's used to draw the addressables um, extension, and you can add as much stuff in, as you want in there. The only thing is be a bit sparing on vertical space because it will be present or option it can be present on any inspector and that can stack quite a lot. Um, and they're also drawn in order that they get added to this delegate. So um, choosing when you get added is important. Um, this is the function for that, relatively simple. We're just drawing two buttons. Um, horizontally aligned, flexible space on the left so they get right aligned, um, not expanding their width so that they stay right aligned, they don't just fill the space. Um, first one is search components, second one is search components in children. Both of them have tooltips that just describe themselves and show their shortcuts. Um, and then uh, when we call these things, we call them with, uh, because the inspector could be locked um, and have a different selection to the actual user selection, what I'm doing is I'm setting the selection to whatever the editor's selection is, so the editor targets, and opening, calling open quick search, and then restoring the selection to what it was previously. Um, it's easier than writing another version of the open quick search method, which we have. Um, and that's it. That's everything that you need to do. Um, now, in the talk, I was in the GCAP version of this talk, I had to race ahead really quickly from each of these sections. I'm already uh, taking three times as much time to do each section. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything that they wanted me to sh show before moving on to the complex stuff? Because we're get about to start the deep dive into crazy bullshit with reflection and um, horrific. <laughs> Horrific abuse of stuff that um, I've only learnt by modding games. Um, all right, cool. Let's get into some spicy bullshit. Okay, so theory first, then we'll get into practice. So the common thre thread through the rest... <laughs> yes, okay. I agree, we're about to get into the, the abuse. Um, the common thread through the rest of the talk is we are going to be accessing things that are not part of the public API. Um, now, importantly, while you have source code for Unity's packages, the internal and private methods of the stuff built into the DLLs, like Unity Editor.dll, Unity Engine.dll, all of the others, that's more opaque, right? You just got to handle the book on the documentation or see what they've released online. Now, <laughs> modern disassemblers are fucking magic. Um, because they have provided 
the full uh, simple files and debug information for these things. Um, they come out even, and they, they'll even keep their um, summary comments. The they'll, You'll essentially be able to browse through those DLLs as if they were source code. You just can't modify them. Uh, now, regarding the assemblers, I have used ILSpy, which is free. I've used .peak, which is free, and I use Rider quite a lot. Um, Rider is basically an ID that just has .peak inside it. Um, because of familiarity and preference, I will be mostly talking about Rider and .peak, uh, but you'll be able to do all this stuff with any uh, disassembler of your, your choice. Um, the, for those who haven't tried these things before, um, install .peak, open it up, and drag in the Unity editor and Unity engine.dlls from your installation. And it will just show you all of the source code. They'll just appear as classes, and you just browse through them, and they are well-formatted source code. Um, if you're in Writer, um, just open a Unity project and like follow, like use go to definition on any method that you don't have source code for. It will just jump to a disassembly of it. Um, so um, navigation for both is very simple. It's Control T to simple uh, simple search the entire project. So um, basically, uh, you'll be able to tab to select whether you want classes or other things or just uh, search through all. <clears throat> um, the second thing, one sec. Um, <clears throat> like Visual Studio, F12 or Control Click follows the definition to its um, definition. If it is a definition, it does it in reverse and shows the usages. These are very damn useful, and we'll get to that in a second. And finally, Alt forward slash, like the um, Git component search that um, just finds stuff within your current type, which is usually, because the way disassembler works, it'll be one file per type. So find in, it's essentially member lookup in this file. Okay, so disassembler diving, disassembly drilling, lots of names, everyone's got their own terminology for it. Basically we have the access to the entire source code for all of the managed, so, uh, managed code in Unity. Um, they like, not the, the C++ stuff in the executable, but most stuff doesn't live there anymore. But when, like, there's just too much to read there. You're not going to be able to actually go and find anything meaningful if you just start reading it top to bottom. So the process is you go and try and figure out some particular problem. Um, you generally, after, like, a particular line, at most, a, a function, you want to find where they've done something that relates to the problem you have. So like I might need to know exactly where they're changing a variable or exactly when a particular GUI element is being drawn and look up how that's being done. And it really helps to be specific. Um, the next step in this process is to think of starting points. We are essentially going to be blind searching through the entire source code of the editor DLLs. Um, so we'll be simple searching uh, or text searching you're going to essentially need to guess the name of some part in the chain of execution for what you're after, or variables. So um, think of string names that will match up. Think of methods names or class names that it will be related. GUI, GUI classes are very helpful for this because the name of a GUI window generally matches up really closely with the um, the actual GUI class in the um, in the source code. And GUI code is also very easy to read as long as they haven't written it in that um, horrific new UI API thing of theirs. Um, the other thing is keep coming up with new starting points because you're probably going to run into dead ends. Um, like in this talk, I'm not going to cover any dead ends, but when you do it yourself, you absolutely do. It is very trial and error and it takes time. So don't just think of one thing, try it, and then fail and go, oh, well, it's impossible. No, you got to constantly try coming up with new ones. So once you've got at least one starting point, um, use simple search, text search, um, through the project, trying to find stuff that relate to that. Um, and at this point, you don't want to read anything that you find in detail. You just want to read, like skim read it exclusively to try and figure out, like, if you can figure out that this probably doesn't relate to what you're, the problem you're trying to solve, 
skip it and move on to the next one and see if you can do this as quickly as possible because you're generally going to be hitting lots of these. The idea here is just to narrow it down and find the ones that possibly are worth looking into. Um, once you do find one that actually relates to what you're interested in, um, generally the, the trick is to follow use um, find usages or go to the definition of that thing. You're generally moving up or down the execution order or following a variable uh, variable usage pattern or like you find a, vari um, a variable that relates to this thing, then you go and look through all the usages of that variable or or just sliding up or down like like this is either in a, what I'm after is either in a function that's further down the line than this or is in a function that has called this one. So um, using those sort of referential uh, navigation tools just browse your way through the source code. Um, and every time you, you come to a new place which is relating to it, you essentially just restart the process over. You, you read through everything in detail and you pick for starting points for where you're gonna go deeper. Like, does, does, like, which methods in this thing actually sound like they relate to the problem I'm trying to solve? Or is it happening outside here? Is it in the thing that's calling this method? Um, so, Basically, it's it's an it's a recursive process. You you keep on applying this until you get closer and closer, until eventually you either hit a complete roadblock and have to go back to square one and try a different approach, or you find the thing you're after. Congratulations, you find it. This doesn't always happen, but for example, let's assume it does. Uh, the next part, what do you do with it? Well, this depends on entirely what you're trying to do. Like, are you just trying to replicate the thing? Are you just trying to find out how and where it happens? Um, it might be that you're looking for the source of a bug. But let's assume that you want to change something or replicate something. Replication is really easy, um, usually. Not all, it's not always possible though. Uh, sometimes you're really lucky. You can just copy the whole, their code out into, and they've just used public API functions. Even though it's hidden internal or something, you, their code just works in your code. And that's cool. You just, copy and paste is like the most People, it gets a bad rap, but it's actually the most reliable way to do this because it doesn't rely on you actually touching, maintaining any connection to their code. You've just done something perfectly valid. Um, more often than not, if something is internal, it relies on other internal stuff. So that's, that's the best case scenario. The next best case scenario is, uh, can you copy and paste theirs and um, call the missing ones by reflection? Not always possible. Sometimes you can uh, call the whole method by reflection. Uh, case in point, I have actually hijacked entire windows through reflection. Like I will have my window uh, that has custom tools in it, and then I will draw the entire timeline window inside it by calling the timeline windows. I'll, I'll create a timeline window. I'll dock it to something else behind this window, um, and then I'll call timeline windows on GUI function inside my own on GUI function, and I'll mess with the timeline windows variables using reflection, and I'll just hijack that thing so it, it behaves like it's part of my window. So you can do a lot with this. Um, so don't ever knock reflection. It's really not good practice to use it inside a game because of various problems like AOT issues, performance issues, all kinds of stuff like that. It's also just complicated. But in the editor, if you need to, it's there and it's very good. Modification is where we get a bit more interesting. This is kind of like, this is a big part of why this talk exists. There are times when you, you find something that they've gone and put in the code and you don't have a way to replicate it. Like you can't just pull it out or you can't just modify, like um, call it by reflection and call it differently. There's, there's something in there where you, like, you want to stop them doing something. You want to change what they're doing. And if you can't, if you absolutely can't do that through the previous methods, there is a way to do it, and it sounds so much scarier than it actually is. Runtime assembly patching. Um, we can effectively just modify the source code at runtime. This is how Unity games get modded. Now, slide aside, this is also how I figured this out. So, one of my things in my spare time is I do not very good at, but I, I'm a hobbyist speedrunner. And um, I was trying to pick up the game Proteus, which is a first-person shooter, very Doom-like, very fancy, lots, like, I just, I'm a slut for a shotgun that has good pacing. Um, so the problem was there weren't good speedrun tools for that. 
there was something that somebody had made in Cheat Engine, but I wanted um, good IGT as an in in-game timer, reliable in-game timer for my runs, and I also wanted to have ghosts for my movement, so I could perhaps like essentially practice doing a level and then race myself. Um, so I had to mod it, and I was like, okay, well, it's built into IL it's Unity game built in ILTCP. Oh, okay, well, that probably makes it impossible. And then it clicked for me. It's like, wait, I've played Beat Saber on my quest with mods. That has to be ILTCP. What the hell? And so I looked it up, and it turns out the RimWorld modding community built the most powerful patching tool that exists. It's called Harmony. So out of the box, um, .NET, uh, Mono, etc., comes with this thing mono Cecil um, component, which is essentially like, it allows you to modify the source code. And this is kind of built off that. The problem is that the conventional methods that people normally use are destructive. You you replace the existing method and you write a new one using like MSIL or CLR or whatever it's called now. It, you write it in assembly and, and destroy the, ex the original method effectively. You unlink it. Harmony handles this like a Bethesda mod. So, um, it can handle multiple modifications. Uh, it basically it adds prefix and postfix functionality. So you can you can add code to the start or end of a existing method, right, without damaging the internals, like without changing the internals at all. Um, prefixed code can decide whether or not it w the rest of the method gets to run, so it can abort out. Uh, prefix methods uh, they can also manipulate the input, so uh, parameters. Postfixes can just do stuff afterwards. They can also modify return results. Um, and you can have multiple prefixes and postfixes on the same method. You can even add and remove them at runtime. It's a little bit expensive to do, but yeah, you can. Um, they built this because they wanted to have a giant modable stackable, stacking mods, stackable mods framework for RimWorld, which didn't have one. I think, I wasn't sure if RimWorld was mono game or Unity, but it doesn't matter. The, the upshot of this is that for modern games, this became the go-to way to inject co uh, code into .NET platforms. Um, but modders and developers don't talk to each other, so I haven't spoken to anyone else who knows this exists. Um, it's absolutely amazing. It's mature. It a mature project's been going on for years. It's fantastic. Um, it also has functionality to modify the contents of the function. So if you absolutely have to go and modify something that's inside the function, like you can't just prefix or postfix it. Uh, they've got transcode, which is where you, you get given an array of the current contents of the uh, assembly language and you will return your copy. And if multiple patches are doing transcoding the same method, uh, what they'll do is they'll get, um, one method will get it and then the next uh, next patch will receive the, the modded copy from the previous one, and so forth, and so forth. So it's it's kind of brittle compared to the other solution, the other options, and it's also a lot of work. I only have had to use it once for one thing, but it exists if you really need it. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's get onto the actual bullshit. Let's actually just do this. So, um, and this is the shortest example I could come up with for this. Uh, we want deep links. We want the ability to click a link in the browser and have Unity do something as a response. Now, we know that Unity does this um, because the assets, if you go to the asset store in the browser and you click one of the links there, it will fire up Unity and it will open that in the package manager window, which is very interesting. It also, if you um, haven't disabled the pop-up in your browser, you'll also find out that the links use the extension unity 3 dcomunity 3 dkarma So that's helpful for us to know. Um, so we want to be able to have a pretty gen generic way to steal that. So starting points. Um, obvious things when we're going to look for this. Well, I forgot to mention this, but that comunity 3 dkarma doing a, a text search for that might be a really good idea. Didn't think of that when I was doing this myself. Um, I look. I started immediately with the package manager and methods that have URL in their name. Um, ideally, what we're looking for is that the URL gets passed by a callback somewhere 
that we can hook into or it gets stored somewhere and like we can read that and then if we're interested in it we can kill the package manager window uh, but given the fact that i just explained about runtime pa assembly patching um you know that's not what's going to happen um so when we do this we go searching for clues we just start um in my case i chase down the package manager i just um, started searching for package manager window and found it instantly because it matches the name. Um, hell, I'll just show this. Apologies if the text is a bit small, but like, so here, yeah, just control T, simple search, go to classes, uh, package manager win window. Cool. All right, cool. So give it a couple of seconds to open it up. This is the disassembly for the package manager window. There's not a huge amount here, decent amount. So rather than reading through that, we do this uh, member search in files. So, and we just want to find everything that does open. Okay, so we've got, what, four hits? All right, uh, open our package by name. Open URL looks pretty fucking sus, doesn't it? All right, so here we go, open URL. And yeah, okay, all right. So slides explain this one better, so I'll just give me a second to jump back to them. All right. So open URL sounds like we're on the right track. Um, this method gets the, the full URL we're after because we can see that this is the thing that is, um, it's opening the package manager window with an asset store package, or it can also do it with a um, another type of package. This seems to be two types of links that it looks for here. <sighs> but, um, oh yeah. So like if we try to, Find, like, essentially, it's not storing the, the URL in any form we can get access to. Um, and yeah, so if we go and try to like, uh, find usages on it, it tells us there are no usages of this method. And that's, well, that kind of checks out because um, it has the used by nat uh, native code attribute, which means that Unity's C++ code is explicitly calling this static function which means that any code here is not going to be like it's not, that that C++ code is not going to call our function unless we were to do something that's where we disassemble the C++ part of Unity, rebuild the exe with that modification, deal with the legal ramifications of that, etc, etc. No, let's just leave that alone. Um, the nice thing about runtime assembly patching, you're not actually changing the executable on disk. It's much better. Um, so. This is the only place that gets it, um, and it doesn't store it. So replication isn't going to help us. We replicate it, and our one's not going to get called. Um, we have to modify this existing function, and we need to basically look at the link. If the link is something we care about, we use it. Otherwise, we just let it flow through and let the package manager use it. So this is it. Um, this is the whole harmony patch to do that. Uh, this actually doesn't do anything with the link. This is just a generic kind of uh, give the rest of my code access to this. So the first part here, whenever I'm writing patches, two, two important things to understand. First of all, whenever I'm, I'm writing a patch, I will put it in its own assembly. It simplifies things a lot. Um, the second thing is I always keep the patching process in a static class of its own, which I generally call patcher. Um, this is just to help in case a particular um, assembly actually has, I, I've stacked together multiple patches together as one, or, well, uh, technical details, it, I just find this keeps things very clean. Um, basically what we do is we have an initialize and load method for this case. You don't always want to do that, I'll cover that in a bit. Um, but the, the critical part here is that we create a new Harmony instance. Um, oh, by the way, I may have I skipped over something here. Basically, um, in order to use Harmony, you just get the latest uh, build of Harmony off their GitHub, which is a managed DLL. You drop it into Unity and you set it to editor only. And that's it, it just works. It's just an assembly and you just reference it from any um, assembly, like you, any assembly definition that's got patches in it. So that's, that's where these types are coming from. Um, and then we just, um, we go and create a new Harmony instance and we give it a unique name. They say that the, the, uh, the standard for these names is a uh, reverse domain syntax that is descriptive of its, of its 
purpose. So in this case, I just went com.createSmith.url hook. And then you call harmony.patch all. There's other ways of doing this depending on what you want to do. Harmony has lots of options. Patch all is useful because what it does is it goes through the current assembly and it looks for any classes that have got the harmony patch attribute and it treats them as patches. So the rest of our patch is a class static class called open URL patch and it has a how many patch attribute so when we call patch all it will find it and it will do stuff with it um, harmony works by looking for specifically named things specifically named um, parameters functions etc um, so first thing we have here is just like a list of function delegates and these ones just take a string and return a bool and the idea is that if you want to do something with a, a deep link, you will add yourself to this list of listeners, and then uh, you will return true if the if the link was yours, and return false if the link wasn't. And then this is our prefix. This is the actual thing that's just going to get stuck on the start of our, that open URL function. And all we do is we loop through those listeners. Um, because we're in the prefix, we also get the ref, the um, URL. We don't necessarily need to have a ref here. You can, and that will let you modify it for things going forward, but you can actually just not have it as that. That's actually kind of a typo for this case. It's not necessary. Um, but yes, we, we go through, we run through all the listeners. Um, we invoke each one with the URL, and if it returned true, we return false. Returning false from your prefix is basically saying don't return the don't run the, the original method just kill us here um, the if you have multiple um, prefixes they get run in order and the first one to terminate the function uh, like when one terminates the function the, the prefixes following don't get, get called um, and obviously as a result any postfixes don't get called so bear in mind if you're multi patching something you, you you might miss out on your prefix if something else is interfered with it but I guess in our case it's probably pretty rare. Um, yeah, so that that will work. Um, the only final part of this is it needs to specify the method that it's patching to, and it looks for target method, and it just returns a method base which is just the base class of method info. And uh, Harmony provides really nice, clean um, uh, reflection lookup. Uh, rapid functions. So access tools is where you find those and like access tools dot method lets you specify like a type co type colon method name string and it won't care about the binding flags. It will just find it. It's a bit slower than the reflection call but it's so much cleaner. So we're just going and getting the package manager window dot open URL function there and returning it. Um, and that's it. That is steals the link. And so like Previously, I, well, we don't actually have anything that uses it yet, so let, let's go and add something that uses it. So let's just make a little um, header URL item that shows the GUID of any asset. So it's only present if it's an asset. Um, and it's got a click copy link button. And then if we click, if we paste that link into a browser, what it will do is it will open the, um, it will select that asset and it will ping it. So it'll draw the little outline around it. Um, so let's do that. So first of all, I, I got the code running, so let's just demo that. So, um, all right, here we go, here's project. So let's just go to like the enemy tank pre prefab and there's the GUID link up there. Notice that it gets double uh, duplicated in here. This is something you need to be a little bit careful with that um, uh, that header because some things like prefabs for instance will draw the header twice and you need to sort of write in something to, to check that if that matters to you in this case in this case it really doesn't to us um, but yeah so that's um, so that's the good click copy link and let me just bring over a browser window paste in that link hit enter and it has selected and highlighted the asset. Now, I actually had that asset selected, so let me just do it again. See? Nice and simple. Go and slap these things into your bug tickets or tasks. 
I was like, hey, this prefab's fucked. Um, cool. Let me just clean up my workspace again. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's go and build that. It's really going to be quite simple. So this is all the source code. It's very small. It's very small on the screen, but let's break it down. Okay, so the first one is once again, we're going to make a new uh, header. Um, so exactly as before, we just bind the editor dot finish default um, header GUI callback with another like GUI function of ours. Um, we then, like this is another class, we go and add our own on URL function to the listeners for our open URL patch that we just wrote. Um, and we also go and define our own custom URL prefix. Um, this is just a nice clean way of doing URL, like doing this particular thing. Um, this is both the, the string that we'll be slapping. Like basically our links will just be this prefix with a GUID string concatenated on the end. So we can identify these string our, our links by just saying, does it start with these exact characters? Ignore case. And then once we have found them, we can just strip that off the front and we have the GUID. So really simple for this example, but if you wanted to add in the functionality for say like multiple items, that's really easy to do just outside the scope of this talk. So here's that on your function. This is not the patch. This is the thing that uh, we've added to the listeners that the patch will roll through before it lets the function run. So if this thing returns true, um, the patch will abort out of the function. Um, the So here we go. So we've passed in the URL. We check, does this start with our prefix? If it doesn't, return false. It's not ours. We don't care. If it does, um, from this point onwards, we return true even if there's an error because we don't want this to flow on to anything else. Worst case scenario, we don't want the package manager just getting a GUID and trying to do something with it. So um, first thing we do is we just grab the GUID by substringing, the, like deleting the first part of that string. Um, and then we convert that to an asset path. And then we check if that path is null, like uh, null or empty because the GUID is invalid. And if that's the case, we just scream to the log, just let that that link was fucked. Um, otherwise, it's valid. We got a path, therefore it's an asset, so we can load the asset. Um, this technically could go wrong, but it's incredible. It basically requires a file to be corrupted. Um, so we load the asset, we set the selection to that asset, and then we ping the asset. Uh, which editor GUI utility ping object does that, um, and then we return, return true, even if it was an error. And that's it. Um, okay, and then we just do that GUI header function. It's basically the same as the last one. Um, in this case, we only draw this one if you've only got one thing selected because we only want to show a single GUID, uh, like a single selection. Um, the second part here is that we only do it if it's got an asset path because you might have selected a scene object. And while you could write a version of this that knows how to handle scene objects, that is a much more complicated thing. Ah, oh, it's not that much more complicated. There isn't a good solution to it. it. It will be a bit slow, but you could do it. Um, but yeah, the rest of this is just like horizontal layout, um, flexible space, not actually no flexible space, just like uh, disabled text field that draws the um, the good contents. And then um, on the right of that, a button, which is copy link. And if you click the copy link button, um, it just, writes the concatenated string of URL prefix plus GUID as a string um, to the GUI utility dot system coffee buffer, which is the way you access the clipboard in Unity. You can either just read or write from um, text from that. And that's it. That That is literally what I just showed you. That wasn't so hard. Like the patches aren't so hard. That thing wasn't so hard. Um, it's like, I, got, I can't stress this enough. Runtime assembly patching actually sounds terrifying. Um, it's using Harmony, it is freakishly easy. The most difficult part is really looking up and researching what you're like, where is the thing I'm actually trying to modify? How can I safely modify this without breaking things? Um, you can get in and, and actually like, if they, you find a bug in the GUI code, like there's a bug in the indentation of the um, reorderable lists <laughs> the reorderable lists. Uh, uh, look, I can't remember exactly the what the function is called. Otherwise, I'd show you. Um, 
they actually don't indent themselves based off the indentation level of the rest of the UI. No, they go and indent themselves based off the number of full stops in the property name that the list is based off. I'm guessing that like if you haven't played around with property drawers a lot, you might not know that, but like know how bad that is. But if you have a um if you use a list in a weird place and you don't want it to indent itself and the the property it's assigned to just happens to have four full stop by full periods in the in there, ah uh, yeah, it will just go and shove itself off to the right. You could actually just fix that problem and write a new version of it as a prefix, return the correct value, that sort of stuff. So like go nuts. If something's bugging you, you can absolutely mess with it. So, uh, does anyone have any questions or things that they want in more detail before we move on or things you want me to uh, show? Any, any variations or things I skipped over? I still sort of have to wait for like 30 seconds for the stream to catch up with me. No, it looks like we're good. Okay, well, let's go and actually get to the full, fully um, batshit crazy part of the talk. Um, let's just fucking filter the inspector. Now, like, the, the uses for filtering the inspector are something that's kind of hard to explain until you've actually used an editor that has inspector filtering. But generally, it's like you, you've got 100 components and you don't know which one you're after but you'd know that you want, you're looking for something called rotation or you, you're looking for something color or like a particular material or something like that. Um, in Unity, you, the only way to do this is just to scroll through the fucking inspector. And on some of the projects that I've been like mid to large size Unity projects, it's exhausting. And you generally scroll past what you're after and, oh, yeah. So like, in other engines that support this, like like Godot, like Unreal does it too. Like you just you just type in the name and it filters down to that. Well, conventional wisdom in Unity is if you wanted to do that, you would actually need to go and write your own custom inspector window and maintain that. Which if you have, you'll know that it's actually a bit more work to maintain that against API changes than you really want to do often. Um, so let's just runtime patch it and pretend that we did something that wasn't horribly wrong. Um, so what we're after is basically this. We want the same filter box thing that's on top of all the other Unity winners, you know, the hierarchy window, the project window. We just want the same one. And we want it to work basically the same way. Um, now, the caveat to this is there's no good way to do this. This is kind of why I think Unity hasn't done this themselves, because there's so many custom inspectors even especially for the Unity intern, like the inbuilt um, uh, components, that there's no good way to, to sort of selectively just remove lines based on filtering because the standard function that does this, like there's too many custom functions drawing random crap. But what we can do is we can handle the default inspector case that's used by almost every inspector that exists. Um, and we also can do one step further than that. We can, the first thing we'll do is we'll just make it so that if none of the fields you've typed in match, like regardless of what it draws, every single component has properties. That's how everything's stored. And we'll just f filter the property names. And if nothing in a, in a component matches the text we've typed in, hide the entire inspect, uh, hide, the, hide the entire component from the inspector, not the header for the component, we keep that. We just delete all, like, don't let it's even its custom inspector draw. And then as the second stage, we'll go through and filter the, the lines that we can. So, well, we've got one really good starting place for this, because if you've ever written a custom inspector, you know that on inspector GUI is the function you override for that. So, um, the default, it'll either be a default implementation of that or something calling it. So um, if we crack this up in, the, in this example, I could do this, but I mean, it's right here. Um, we find out that on Inspector GUI, the default implementation just calls draw default inspector. And so we've looked that up and 
there's a chain of essentially a couple of functions, but we eventually just get to do uh, it calls Drew, do draw default inspector, and the that the final version of that is just a static function that takes the object. It's called and it does a bit of startup, like begin change check, update required, not related to our stuff. But this this is the entire um, this section here is how every single inspector um, property field is drawn. So this is the thing that's actually drawing a default property. The property field list for anything that doesn't have the um, um, for the inspector. What's more, this on inspector GUI thing here is what's overridden if you are um, overriding the custom inspector. So, well, this gives us a lot to go on. We both know we both have we know how to handle both our filtering types from here. Basically, this is where the default default inspector is called, and the and this is where custom inspectors are written from. So we could patch do draw default inspector, but that would only work on default inspectors. Or instead, we could patch every single on inspector GUI method for all derived classes and prefix them out if, if they don't meet our filter. And that'd do it. So that's here's that prefix. So the first part here works pretty similar to the other ones. Um, as I said before, we will you'd be seeing that filter uh, method again. This time we're not scoring with it, we're just filtering. So the idea here is that um, here's an initialize on load method. Um, it, we use a delay call here to try and make this one be like hopefully the last one so it's put down at the bottom of any other headers. Uh, but yeah, we're just calling editor.finished head, uh, default header GUI um, and putting our GUI function onto that. Um, and then in that GUI function, all we do is we just draw a text field. And then uh, we don't draw it if it's a asset importer. Um, didn't do this initially, and I discovered just how many things break if you start playing around with that asset in orders. So that was, um, what is going on here? Oh, cool. Um, yes, so the the next thing we do is we call patch if, patch if, dot patch if needed. Uh, surprise, uh, rather than patching at initialize on load, this patch is only needed when you are using the inspector. So why don't we just do it here? Uh, and then text field, and then we just pre-split it. So whenever we update the GUI, um, just split the uh, the search string into words once, as opposed to every time filter gets called. Um, yeah, and uh, as I mentioned, patch it up, patch if needed is called in the GUI function. Uh, this is just because patching is expensive and putting too much stuff on initialize on load means that Unity will take that much time every time it does a domain reload or re like full recompile or first startup or a build and it really can crank down on your uh, iteration time. So avoid putting stuff there if you can. This doesn't need to go there, so this goes somewhere else. Um, there's the filter function. This is the trimmed down version of our score, get score function from before. Um, if the, um, the filter text, so the filter text is the full search string, um, if that is null or white space, then this is a blank search. So we just pass, let any string pass. Otherwise we loop through every single um, word we split out from the, the uh, filter text and we see if it um, exists in this string using index of, so we can do case insensitivity. Um, if it part, if any are found, we return true, otherwise return false. Like I, in hindsight, it probably makes more sense to make it so that it requires all the words to be matched. But anyway, like that's kind of homework if you wanted to use this thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So then we just need to write a patch. So to be clear, this patch is just doing the hide the whole component if um, if we don't match the filter. So the idea is we'll look through every single property in the component. If none of them match our, our filter text, then we will say we'll just pre abort the prefix on the on GUI on inspector GUI call. So 
here we are. This is the patcher. Um, patch if needed. So if harmony is null, um, create a new harmony instance. So we have a static thing there. So it's only run once. Um, this one here, we create com.cratesmith.inspector filter and we call patch all. And there is, like, as, as I mentioned before, some, like, we have one patcher, we're actually going to have two patches. Um, and this one will call them both. Um, so the next part here is the harmony patch. Um, the first, so our first harmony patch, we'll get to the, the second one in a bit. This one here, um, we have our prefix method, which is just a replace, it's going to be a replacement for our on inspector GUI. Um, we take in the editor, we, we've got a specially, uh, special argument here, which is underscore underscore instance. Actually, I think it's, is it triple? It's like, it's two. Um, Harmony recognizes that and returns the this pointer through that word. So it has to be typed correctly or you'll get nasty errors. But yeah, um, this is a good example of just like Harmony has a lot of registered um, things. Fantastic documentation for looking all this up. Uh, it's all online. Um, again, if it's an asset, asset importer, we don't do it. Aborting out of asset importers GUI is very bad. Um, then we basically get a iterator, a property iterator from the serialized object that we're looking at, which potentially could be one or many objects. Um, and it just lets us loop through all the properties. So we just call next on it to initialize it. And then we just, while next visible true, um, we just run our filter and check against the display name of that property. If any matched, we return true. We let the, this on inspector GUI call exist. Otherwise we return false, which means that this, uh, we are bought from this one, which means that no GUI items get drawn. But because um, all of these things draw using um, GUI layout functions, or they draw with GUI layout functions, or they draw with a wrapper around GUI, GUI layout functions, more complicated, won't we'll cover it now, but essentially they, they just collapse down if without leaving spaces. So um, the one thing we need to do is we need to specify the, all the target methods for this patch. So there is target method, which targets a single method, but Harmony will also look for the method called target methods, which returns uh, an enumerable of method bases. So again, this is just returning method infos. Um, and for brevity, we're using their nice access tools one that's in Harmony, Harmony's uh, zero harmony .dll. Uh We just go access tools all types. That's just every single type that's in the current um, domain. And then where that type is not abstract, it is, and it is an editor. And then from that, we select um, the everything that matches that. Basically, we get the on inspector GUI functions from all of those. So again, using link in a build, this be shit, but in this case, it's not bad. And we're not even doing that on startup, so it's okay. Um, and yeah, that will patch all of these with one patch. And that's it, except, um, well, there's a couple of things still to do. So at this point, like my demo will not show this. My demo will show, um, actually I can show it, but it will, you'll also see the other filtering going on so at the same time. So let me just bring up Unity again. And the other thing is that this would look like, this thing here will look like a text box, a regular text field. We'll fix that at the end. Um, let's pick something that's, because I've got, I've got a bug with one of my um, prefabs here that doesn't work well with this, but like model. Now, actually there is a bug here where this one is, these uh, projectile ones are not filtering properly, but you can see that the um, the colliders have, com and this doesn't have the word model in any of its properties, so it's deleting the entire thing. Um, I actually suspect that there's a, a bug in my second patch that's been introduced since the talk and it's actually breaking the, the inline filtering. I'll need to check that. But moving right along. Um, so um, the property field one. Well, there are four overloads of property field. And 
unfortunately, they are all just pointing to the same one. They're just providing different con uh, com combinations of uh, parameters. And this is the one that gets used. So, so um, property field is, so for reference, property field is the function that the default inspector drawer uses on every field that is, um, on every, like when you when you don't have it on a custom inspector, it's the only function it calls to draw your properties. Um, so it calls this, which actually does the work. This looks up which drawer to use. It like figures out the position because property drawers don't use GUI layout. They call, just use regular GUI functions. Um, so we found exactly where it happens. This is really easy. The thing is that, um, so to filter properties, we just need to write a prefix that for the, for, um, the function there to uh, remove that function, that will stop that function if the property we're looking at doesn't match, match the filter. Um, both of the methods, uh, editor GUI layout property field and this one, are good candidates for that. You can abort either of them. There is only, this is the only method is called by property, like property field only calls this method and the inspector, the default inspector only calls property field, like editor GUI layout or property field. Um, so a slight note here, if ever given the choice between patching something that's part of the public API or the private or private or internal API, always go with the public one because it's much less likely to change. Um, so like we know that they're not going to change or modify or remove um, editor GUI layout and property field. So it's going to be much safer. Whereas they could change the implementation of it drastically between versions because we're not supposed to be looking at that. Um, so this is the patch. Now I've got a little bit fancy here. Um, if you're writing a patch for types that you have public API access to, um, the easier way to specify the target is just to put it in the harmony patch attribute. So uh, the reason that this one is so long is because uh, there are multiple over, um, overloads, sorry, overrides of uh, the, sorry, overloads. I always get the two, two words mixed up. Um, of uh, property field. So in this case, we specify all of its function arguments. Um, otherwise, this would just be type and name. And yeah, so then we start our static class for the patch. Um, this is almost exactly the same as the component filter patch, except we're applying it to the property, uh, property field function. So slight difference in the way that we do the iterator um, because we're given a property but we no, don't want to mess with that one so we take we copy it and then we're not going to the end of the object we just want to go to the end of this property so we ask for this properties get end property and we loop until we reach that um, and yeah so we we loop through and say okay well the reason we're looping is because properties are allowed to have children that they display so we filter everything in, and then we call like we filter the current one then we call um actually i can see where i've gone wrong it's right there um it happened before i wrote the talk i'm calling it on the um i'm checking the property the original property's name not the iterator's name uh but yes if this property matches the filter um return true include and that includes children of that property um, otherwise, keep iterating through that one and all of its visible children until we get to the end. Uh, if none of them matched, return false, and that would just remove this one property line, not the whole, comp not, the, not the whole um, components inspector. Um, yeah, and you might have noticed also that there's a check for active at the top of this. Um, so we're going to go and revise our previous patch to add this in, because. This function is used all throughout the editor. It's absolutely everywhere, but we only want it to be applying inside the inspector. Um, so the way we're going to do that is we're just going to turn a bool on in the prefix of the um, on inspector GUI, and we're going to turn it off using a prefix. So again, just modifying the last patch. 
Uh, this is the on inspect degree patch from before. And in the prefix, the one change we've made here is before returning true, if we successfully, if this um, one matched is, and we just set property field patch dot active to true. Um, ideally, we could also turn it, um, we could also turn it on up here, but we don't want it running for asset importers. We want it to not work, so we'll leave that off. Um, yeah. Otherwise, return. Um, well, leave me alone with that alone. Anyway, the prefix, the prefix, sorry, postfix does the opposite. It just sets it to false, and because this only uh, if active is false, we just return true, which means that the property draws normally does nothing. Like it just the the prefix does nothing. It just lets it run. Um. So. And the final step is just to make it look pretty. Um, it's not really a, a pretty issue, it's more a UX issue. Because people see this text field thing on the left, and it's like, uh, what's that? Am I writing in a description? Whereas this one here is the same uh, UI element that they use for all their like, filters. So let's steal it. Um, Edge degree layout dot toolbar search field it's not public, it's an internal function, but I mean, we've already reflected so many functions at this point, What's why, let it stop us. Um, we're going to call this one a lot, so good practice is to just wrap it with our own static method, that, and then have like a static um, storage caching off the method info, because looking up the method info is, is a sizable amount of the cost of running reflection. So inside our own search field function, we take exactly the same arguments as theirs. If we haven't looked up and cached their method, we just do it. In this case, I'm using the access tools one, but outside of this, you could use reflection just normally. And then when we're going to call editDegreeLayout.text area, we just call this search field function instead, and it will draw the correct element. And yeah, we just did what um, Unity didn't do in 15 years in like well, the original talk did this in 15 minutes. I think we took about 30 minutes for this one. So, and also, I think I found the bug. The reason why in this project it isn't working properly. So, I could be wrong, but I don't know. I never give a, lose, a miss a chance to uh, mess up on stream. Um, cool, so this is in the filter. Uh, so, inspector filter? No, it was the other one. Um, this is the, yeah, the property field patch. Okay, cool. Sorry. And yeah. Oh, so the, well, I don't know then, because uh, the bug is actually fixed here. <laughs> the bug is in the slides, but not here. Um, I'll, prop, I'll look at why that's not working in this project afterwards because like the source code is supposed to be a reference to this stuff so yeah I will fix bugs in it um, but yes it should be working where the um, where any of these fields disappear but for some reason right now if I type in model uh, it is still showing effect prefab hit effect prefab on all of those so these ones here should be vanishing um, something has gone wrong uh, it could be some 2021.1 thing that I didn't test properly. So, anyway, leaving that aside, um, yes, uh, at least when I get thing, that thing fixed up, it will work properly. The one caveat is, yeah, if you have an, a custom inspector and it draws stuff that looks like those default ones, it won't do anything for those. It'll only do it for the ones that are drawn by the default system, but it still will clean up the whole, um, it'll still clean up the component and remove the whole component if nothing matches. So it's the best case we can do. But I mean, hey, we did something. Um, and yeah, this is an abrupt ending for a talk, but like the, the if you gotta understand that the original version of this talk was me just going at a hundred miles an hour and only just scraping it at the end. And so like no room for a summary, no room for anything else. I just sort of got to the end questions and then it was like, okay, no, we're out of time. We have to go and take these outside. So, um, but yeah, we've got plenty of time now. So 
did anyone have any questions? Anything that they want in more depth or information? Um, like, in my own time after this, I am going to go and fix that that bug because um, I don't know what's going on because I definitely had this thing working before and it could either be something in my example project that I added in that doesn't work with it or otherwise. Hmm. Okay, I guess we're good then. All right then, well, uh, that was it. I hope you liked it. <laughs> it uh, certainly was a lot of work and goddamn it was hard writing this talk with uh, the uh, when the Unity shit was happening. Um, but yes, honestly, I have no idea how to finish this off given it's on a stream as opposed to a room where people are gonna kick me out. 